we'd be hard pressed in California and maybe all over the United States to think of somebody more important to our industry and in fact he's been recognized for it and and more interesting to listen to and to educate us than Fred Reich. Um, we're just thrilled to have him here today. You know for years as I've worked in this business as many of you today have remarked about how long you've known me we've talked about rollovers kind of casually like gee you know maybe it's a good reason to be in this business because you can get the rollover money when when people leave the plan. So now all of a sudden, the regulators have got their big fuzzy nose under the tent, and they've decided, of course, that this cannot possibly go on in a positive way without rules that everybody has to follow. So it's a fascinating topic, and as I said, we're just as pleased as we can be to have Fred with us. Fred Reich, would you like to take it away for us? All righty, thank you. Thank you, Patricia, and hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, distributions and rollover tires and retirement income and, and what's going on, both from a big picture perspective all the way down into the weeds, including what you all can do about it. But, but you know, let's go back to, to sort of get a big picture perspective as context for the whole program. By the way, I apologize for my voice. I've been fighting a cold. but. Uh, I'm beyond the infectious period, so you all don't have to worry about it. Uh, the, uh, we've had accumulation for many years in 401k plans and 403b plans, essentially participant-directed plans. And so the money has grown, and, and, and all of our focus has been on low expenses, good advice, high-quality investments. How do we accumulate enough money? How do, you, how do you get to that magic number where you can actually retire with some degree of dignity? What's happening now is that's changing because that wave of boomers that were the front edge of 401k and 403b plans, and in terms of both of them being the primary retirement plan, they're reaching retirement now. And the money's starting to come out of the plans. It's rolling over to IRAs. So a, a part of, this, of the focus of the government and of the think tanks and of the academics is, how's that money going to last for a lifetime? Uh, let's say a 65-year-old is going to live to be 95. And there's a, 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 for a 65-year-old couple, there's at least a 25% probability one of them will live to be 95 years old. In other words, a big enough probability to plan for. So how do you get that money to last for 30 years in retirement? Uh, also, how, how do you avoid somebody who's been in this protected 401k environment where the plan sponsor made all the big decisions about expenses and the quality of the investments. How, how, how do you then say, uh, by the way, you've been in this really bubble-wrapped environment as a participant. We realize that you're not very sophisticated on investments. Everything you own in mutual funds and investments may be what the plan sponsor selected for you. In other words, you may not own anything outside. By the way, you're 65 years old now. Get out of the plan. Go to retail. And whatever happens to you, happens to you. Well, people are looking at that and saying, gee, that's not a very pretty picture. So that's where we're going from the accumulation period to the decumulation period. And we're giving really, the government and the policymakers are putting really intense focus on decumulation for the first time. All kinds of things are going to come out of this. If we, if we have a meeting 15 years from now, like this meeting today, some of you will be certified, or you'll have initials after your names. At, for retirement investing and retirement planning. I mean, I can just see all of that coming down the road. But anyway, that's a big picture of why. Now let's get a little more detailed, not real detail, but a little more detailed about why. Well, at this point, there are $5.4 trillion in IRAs, primarily made up of rollovers. So one reason why is there's a lot of money. Reason why people are interested, reason why some feel that former participants need to be protected. Uh, according to Cirilli from an article, it's a, a, a research group, from an article in the Wall Street Journal, <coughs> estimates that workers rolled over from 401k plans last year, the total rollovers from 401k plans to IRAs last year, $358 billion. Uh, and for this year, it'll be even larger. Uh, between 2014, this year, and 2018 inclusive, they estimate that $2.1 trillion will come out of 401k plans 
and Roland Iris. In other words, the numbers are staggering. And, and people's lives are going to depend on what happened. Not when they're 65 years old, but when they're 80 and 85 and 90 years old. The quality of their lives, what financial fear they do or do not have, will depend on that rollover process. Are the advisors who work with them people who understand retirement investing? Are, are, are they advisors who focus on making sure they get into good quality, low-cost investments? Are they advisors who understand how you invest for money to be withdrawn rather than how you invest for money to be accumulated? All kinds of things <coughs> are going on that have to be understood. But the dollar amounts are huge. Uh, I don't know if you all saw the article, but recently Schwab set, went to its customers, its retirement plan customers, who had a total of $25 billion in their plans and said to them, if you don't give us access to your participants, we'll fire you as clients. So Schwab, realizing that the margins at retail are much greater than the margins at wholesale or institutional, in other words, a plan lever, level, are insisting that their plan sponsors give them access to the participants. Uh, and I assume they want to do the right thing by the participants, but nonetheless, looking at their own profitability. Uh, so that's, that's the dollar amount, the potential conflicts of interest. Uh, a second issue is that people are becoming aware of this, individuals and trade associations. Here's an article uh, by Bank of America Merrill Lynch where they did a survey, going broke in retirement is a top fear of Americans. <clears throat> How does that money last for until they, until they die? Um, Closely connected to all of that, by the way, is, uh, I, I think at least, is elderly, uh, protecting the elderly. Because, you know, while most of us envision a, a participant receiving a rollover as a 65-year-old, it's going to be going to Europe and visiting the grandkids and everything, there's another version of the retiree, and that is a person 85, 90 years old, maybe early stage Alzheimer's, but certainly not financially or in a position to make sophisticated financial decisions. There will be abuses, there already are, that are going on of, of older people. And, and that's, I think, closely connected to rollover IRAs because as the baby boomers retire with these large rollover IRAs, some of them will be taken advantage of in that way. So you can just see increased regulation coming <coughs> there as well. So that's, that's sort of the background. What, is, what does it mean for you? Well. There's, there's regulations I'm going to talk to you all about today, but, but, I, but in a big picture uh, spirit, I want to mention two things. One, no matter uh, what the rules say, no matter how many rules we get, the truth is that litigation and controversy comes out of losses, big losses, not small losses. Somebody being completely inappropriately invested when the stock market goes down. <coughs> Uh, so managing portfolios for retirees in a manner consistent with modern portfolio theory where there's a focus particularly on the preservation of capital is really important. Even if, somebody, if somebody's very aggressive, says I want, I want all my money in stocks and I want you to help me invest it that way, even there I think you need to figure a way to protect yourself because if that person loses their money and they're 75 or 80 years old, and they have very little left to live on, then it comes down to a choice between them and you. Do they say, you were at fault? Or do they say, no, I was at fault. I'll accept those dire financial consequences for the rest of my life. Well, you know, the American way is to blame the other guy. Uh, that's why we have litigation. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I just want to warn you to, to protect yourself there. Also, I think that everybody here has got to come up with a method of retirement investing method, a, a method that is based on withdrawals rather than a method that's based on accumulation. Now with accumulation, you say the mantra is stay the course. The market goes down, stay the course, it'll come back. Just add more money while the market's cheap and you'll end up even better off because it went down than you would have if it hadn't. But with, in the withdrawal stage, the market goes down, that person still needs twenty, fifty, dollars $100,000 to live on that year. They can't wait for the market to come back. So what's your method? What's your philosophy about dealing with the uniqueness of the withdrawal period? How, how, how are you going to manage money in IRAs? Are you going to use annuities, variable annuities, guaranteed minimum withdrawal benefits, 
uh, investment management specifically designed for the withdrawal phase. What are you going to do? Some people have a bucket approach. So much, is, so much for beyond 10 years, so much for the next two or, or three years, and then the bucket in between for the interim period. Do you, are, do you adhere, do, do you embrace the bucket approach? I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. You need to have your way of doing it. Uh, because I see a lot of trouble coming down the road where people run out of money because they had investment losses. Or frankly, we're already starting to see some controversy where people run out of money because their withdrawal rate was too high. People think they can pull out 7 or 10% per year and the money will last forever. It doesn't work. When the market goes down, if you had a million dollars and the market goes down to uh, 700,000, and we've had 30% losses, um, and you pull out 7% of the original million, that's 70,000, but that's 10% of the current market value, the 700,000. That can deplete the fund really fast. So <clears throat> people, uh, we're already starting to see some people accuse their advisors of uh, misinforming them about the proper withdrawal rate and therefore them running out of money. So I think you've really got to focus on these issues and, and have your philosophy. And don't be misled by somebody who says, you know, I want to, I want to shoot for the moon with my investments. Or, or if you help them do that, make sure you properly paper the file so it's clear they want to do that. You advise them that there was a lot of risk involved in that. Nonetheless, they insisted on doing it, and so you tried to help them do it in a prudent manner. Okay, <coughs> that's the big picture. Uh, now let's look at, you know, get down on the weeds a little bit. The government, the, the government guidance started in 2005 with the Department of Labor issuing an advisory opinion on rollover IRAs. And it's essentially it was interpreted as saying, if you're a fiduciary to a plan, you have to be very careful about how you work with participants on capturing roller. But if you're not a fiduciary, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, furthermore, the Department of Labor said that they might, when they issued their reproposal of the fiduciary advice regulation, extend the fiduciary advice regulation to saying that you are a fiduciary if you recommend a distribution. So if you recommend to a participant that they take a distribution, they may extend that fiduciary advice we proposal to cover that. It's not here yet. And I don't know if you all saw, but just today, the Department of, or Friday rather, the Department of Labor extended the anticipated due date for the regulation. It's now January of next year for the reproposal rather than August of this year. Uh, some people are treating that like big news. We've been saying all along that there was no way they would issue a controversial regulation that shortly before the November elections. So we've been saying first quarter of 2000. 15 all along. So uh, I, I don't think that's a big change, but it, but it does push it out a little further and buy time to deal with some of these issues. Um, nonetheless, why? What, what, what's behind all this? A year ago in March, the Government Accountability Office came out and said, participants aren't getting information about what their options are. The SEC and FINRA have come out with guidance. What's behind all of this? Well, I, I think plain and simple, and notwithstanding all the controversy about high expenses and small plans, plain and simple, the government, as they start to look at the rollover and distribution scenario, they're saying, gee, retirement plans are really cheap as compared to IRAs. Even small plans are really cheap as compared to IRAs. For example, no front-end loads. Uh, so all of a sudden, the government is thinking, well, maybe it'd be better if participants left their money in plans and if plans made lifetime distributions to participants rather than rolling it over to IRAs. Uh, I will tell you for large plans, uh, and let's say 100 million and up being my definition of large for this purpose, we're already seeing that happening. Large plans are willing to take on the fiduciary responsibility for the money of people who are no longer there. Some of them are. And they're willing to have flexible distribution methods. You can take your money out as required minimum distributions. You can take it out as monthly installments. You can have periodic distributions if you want to take the kids to, or the grandkids to Europe or Disney. So we're beginning to see very flexible distribution methods in retirement, but really at the large plan level. Because if you think about it, if you were going to leave your money somewhere, you would want that place to be an institution. You'd want to think that 
they're going to be there 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years from now, and that the company isn't going to get shut down and the plan, you know, distributed and, and, and so on. You wouldn't, if you're going to have to go through that, you'd probably want to take your money out to begin with. But in larger plans, we're already <coughs> seeing it. So I think the big push behind this is the government wants for people to take advantage of the institutional pricing inside retirement plans rather than the retail pricing inside of IRAs. I really think that's the story behind it. But let that inform you that as you <coughs> help people invest inside IRAs, to focus a lot on what the cost of the funds are in the IRAs. What are the expense ratios? Because that's a, that's a significant area of governmental concern. I, I do want to talk just a little bit more about this. Um, the <coughs> As you evaluate how you work with participants, there are essentially three or four scenarios of what's going to happen. Uh, let's say you're a fiduciary to the plan. You're acting as an RIA fiduciary to the plan. Uh, you can make a recommendation to a participant that they, that they take their money out of the plan and roll it over to an IRA with you. You can provide them education but not make a recommendation. Or the participant can come to you and say, I've already decided to take my money out of the plan. I want you to help me invest it in the IRA. Or assume that you're a non-fiduciary insurance broker or, or represent financial advisor of a broker-dealer. Essentially the same three scenarios. You can make a recommendation that the participant take the money out of the plan. You can provide, not make a recommendation, but provide education about the advantages and disadvantages of IRAs versus plans. Well, or the participant can come to you and say, hey, I, I, I've decided I'm retiring. I'm going to take my money out of the plan. I'm going to roll over to an IRA. I want the money uh, where I can control it, and I want you to help me do it. Those are essentially the three scenarios in the two settings, fiduciary versus non-fiduciary. Very similar with only a couple of minor exceptions. And the, I'll tell you the one minor exception right now <clears throat> is that if you make a recommendation as a fiduciary advisor, you're in a really difficult position based on the DOL guidance in the 2005 advisory opinion. That's the one area where it's very difficult to build any structure around it that would protect you. So what, when we're working with RIA firms, we're mainly helping them provide education, provide the information about the rollovers and about their services. Um, <clears throat> it's also difficult, getting more difficult under more recent guidance that we'll talk about, for a non-fiduciary advisor to make a recommendation to a participant to take a rollover. That's the big recent change, just a couple months old, and it's because of some guidance from FINRA. Uh, so, but again, education can work there very well, educating a participant on what their alternatives are, helping them make a good decision. And I'm going to go into more detail on that, but I wanted to lay out that framework because I think you'll find almost everything I say from now on will fit into one of those six categories, uh, essentially three categories, one fiduciary, one non-fiduciary.